Sysdig's cloud detection response platform bridges the gap between the cloud tenant, the Kubernetes uh, workloads that run within those cloud providers, as well as the process that are actually executed within containers running in Kubernetes. Now, looking at this view, you can already see that we correlate or aggregate event data from different cloud providers. So we can see that we have AWS CloudTrail, we have Google's audit logging, as well as what's not seen on screen, which includes Azure's um, platform logs. Now, the events themselves, just like any logs, will have different priorities. So they can be from informational, warning, critical, or low, medium, high. So in this case, low is blue. So we're going to focus on what's going on here in the AWS environment. Red are critical events. Now, the first one that's worth pointing out in this AWS environment is we can see the account ID. So it's a very specific tenant that we're dealing with. In it, we can see that uh, multi-factor authentication was actually deactivated for a specific user. Now, this in itself is something to be concerned with. We can see the MITRE ATT&CK tactics, which MITRE ATT&CK is a useful framework to tell us that this is usually associated with persistent threats. We can see that they want to evade detection because they're turning off that extra layer of security, which is essentially another layer of authentication. So they're modifying the authentication process. What we know from the event is that it's critical. It's something we should be concerned with. The user who made the change was this Jorge Salomero. And what's more important, they made the change from within AWS as an AWS internal source IP. And it was done within the region of US East 1. Now, this is going to be really important to know as we tie the story of from the cloud tenant down to the container level. Now, this user, we can see that three events played out. Clicking into the event view, we can see that the user, Jorge Salomero, in all three scenarios had disabled MFA for different users. And these users include the likes of, in this case, it was Jorge Salomero turned it off for Manuel Bora, and it was done within the same region of AW, or US East 1. And again, we have that additional context of what was the account ID, what was the IM user, and again, what was the source IP if the change was made from outside the environment. Now, going back to the summary view, we know that once MFA was turned off for those users, we're starting to see users log in without MFA. That's something for us to be concerned with. We can see from what source IP they actually logged into the cloud environment. And again, we can set up certain guardrails to detect when a user logs in from a suspicious source IP. But in this case, all they needed was password. So we don't know if it was a, 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 an adversary who got access to the password sensitive credentials and they didn't have a source of MFA to prevent them from accessing the environment. So what we want to do is look at these suspicious behaviors and tie that to the Kubernetes environment. So clicking on Kubernetes activity, we then have a view of different clusters that are running within Kubernetes. Simply typing AWS, we can then filter down to the only Kubernetes cluster that was running in AWS. However, that is pretty generic, especially if you have multiple AWS environments. So what you might want to do is tie in US East, for instance, and get the specific region where those changes were happening. As we saw earlier, the user disabled MFA on a specific region for a specific user, then we want to drill down further to see what happened in that region, again, potentially by the same user. Now, like we mentioned already, events can be triggered as you know, informational warning critical. So we're going to focus again on the critical activities that are played out. One of which I'm quite concerned with is this detecting crypto miners using Stratum protocol. There's no reason why internally that we would be testing a crypto mining. And especially we would know whether or not that's an approved protocol that we would communicate over. So clicking into the event, we get a bunch of, um, again, context at the workload level that we can say, okay, it was a successful process that played out but this doesn't necessarily bridge the gap on itself between the cloud tenant and the workload. What we want to do then is click into the event view. By clicking into the event itself, now we get a much better picture. We can see from this Falco, which Falco is used under the hood, the open source technology for detecting runtime threats. We can see that a, a single system call that detected the use of Stratum protocol, we tie that with the other audit logs that we have to get that end to end story. So it says who we can see that the user was running as a group, uh, as a root group 
and it was the root user. So we can see that context under who. Now we know that correlating to what we talked about earlier, this incident occurred in the AWS region of US East 1. So we know that is it not just a coincidence that the user disabled MFA can now access the environment and are now running crypto miner in the same region. Similarly, we tie it into the Kubernetes audit log to be able to say to which cluster did the environment uh, did the crypto miner action play out in? Again, what was the deployment name? And when that deployment was created, what was the pod name and to which node was it running on? So we get all that additional context of within Kubernetes to filter it down and be more granular because of the Kubernetes audit logs. And as well as that, we can we talked about the system call a while ago. That gives us the container level visibility to say what was the container image that was run. So again, was it run by a third party, a malicious image that they're running, or is it just a compromised existing running workload? So we know that in the namespace crypto mining demo that we saw in the Kubernetes view, we can see that the container is now running with the relevant label of crypto mining demo. So it was run specifically for that reason, uh, as opposed to being hijacked, it was actually created for this purpose. And we get the additional context of the workload to see from the system call that, um, for instance, it was run from the temp directory within that container. They ran GCC at that exec path. And we can see from the GCC uh, command itself, we can see that it's clearly uh, using stratum TCP um, command is run. So we know what is going on at the workload process. We know that it was a successful command that was executed. And then we know what container image was tied to it. We know to which cluster, to which network namespace it was running in. So from an incident forensics and response approach, we have all of the end-to-end -end context, all of the different logging sources to tie it together that we can respond to say, this was a network threat that played out inside our cloud and our Kubernetes or cloud native environment. I can click on network activity to then give myself a full topology view specific to that my network namespace we talked about earlier, crypto mining demo. We know that in the namespace, there was a pod called security playground. But from a stratum perspective, we can see what are the ingress and egress requests. We know that the likes of curl and GCC are used. The GCC command was actually executed to talk to port 333. And again, the origin is an external IP. And that was visible from our topology view. Now, if we wanted to white or sorry to blacklist to prevent these kind of threats from playing out where requests could go to uh, suspicious uh, destination IPs, we can then click on generate policy. What this does, it creates a Kubernetes native network policy to say what was the current expected behavior. Well, we shouldn't have ingress traffic, so we're denying that. But for egress, we're only going to allow, well, pretty much any network namespace selector can be used but we're only going to allow UDP port 53 traffic. Anything that isn't UDP 53 from an egress, what we talk out to, that comes from pods that are labeled as security playground, we're just going to deny those requests. I mean, we have no reason to allow them. So any egress that goes out to, for instance, GCC over port 3333, it just can't happen because of network topology or because of the network policy that was generated. But this is somewhat reactive. If an organization wanted to be proactive, they could then choose a different um, cluster, choose um, a namespace that they want to focus on, like this log4j example, see the full topology view, and naturally generate a policy to say, what are the connections I do or do not permit? But this is still somewhat reactive. What we want to do is go back to our insights view. So we go back here, maybe filter for the timestamp we were talking about a while ago and look back at what happened at the very beginning. We talked about a user disabling MFA uh, in order to log into the console without that additional method of security. But if I wanted to limit their blast radius, essentially prevent users from creating EKS clusters if they have no permission or no right to be doing so, um, or essentially just limiting what they can do with the environment to what they normally do in the case of account compromise, we can then click on identity and access see the different users, what permissions are assigned to them, but more importantly, what permissions they're actually using. So in this case, we focus on the unused permissions. That's the real risk. So we talked about Jorge Salamero. He was the one responsible for this whole incident, was the user here. We can then click into identity access, focus on Jorge Salamero. We can see that 
under actionable risk, they are categorized as a critical risk. That means that they are given an excessive amount of permissions, but more or less underutilizing most of those permissions. From a proactive response to prevent this kind of threat from happening in the future, we can click on optimize IAM policy. What this does, similar to network policy, it limits only to what the user really should, what we've seen, what they should have allow access on, and everything else will ultimately drop um, that, those permissions so that the user, in the case of an account compromised, without MFA enabled, they essentially are limited to certain actions within the cloud environment. And that way, we have shown how we tie the system calls, the Kubernetes audit log, as well as the cloud um, audit logs to give an end-to-end -end story of why Sysdigs cloud detection response solution uh, uniquely addresses these threats in the cloud. Hopefully that's helpful.